Hello and happy Tuesday, May 4th. It's a beautifully sunny day on Cortez Island. I'm coming at you from Cortez Radio, CKTZ 89.5 FM. Welcome to Gabbing About Gardening. I'm your host, Lucretia Shanfarber, and that uplifting little snippet of music is called C Minor. It's Compliments of Willow, the all-woman band from Quadra Island. So you know the saying, April showers bring May flowers. Well, it's very, very true this year. The tulips and rhodos are in bloom. The lilacs are starting to open up. The lovely little white strawberry blossoms are starting to open too. And the beautiful pink blossoms on the wild salmon berries are starting to make a show of it themselves. You know, every day, something colorful and fragrant surprises us in the garden. And walking in the woods, well, we're surrounded with maples and arbutus in flower. And at the Cortez Museum's Heritage Gardens, perennial plants are popping up like old friends revisiting. Jane Newman, Managing Director of the Cortez Island Museum and Archive Society, will tell us all about those plants who they are, and where they come from. Then we'll also gab with Nadia Cole. Nadia and her family are making a new life for themselves at the north end of Quadra Island. I know Nadia as a talented leather worker because I have a pair of her amazing repurposed leather earrings. And I know there's a new garden, a tiny house, two children, and some goats in the picture. So I want to hear more about it and I'm sure you do too. Then we'll check in with Jennifer Bankstall from her family's 40-acre homestead, where she is always making something amazing in her farm kitchen. Jen will gab with us about what she's making and how she's making it. Hint, there are flower blossoms involved. And then we'll dial up Owen Williams, a gardener who is mastering the fine art of growing in big containers. Owen will gab about what he's growing and how he grows it. That's all coming up on today's Gabbing About Gardening. I'm Lucretia, and we have Jane Newman with us. Hello there. Hello, How are you doing, Jane. Lucretia? Nice to hear you. <laughs> Wonderful to hear you. Oh, it's been too long. It has been a long time. <laughs> way, way too long. I think everybody's been in their garden. Well, you know, I know you're an enthusiastic gardener, one of the founding members of the Cortez Island Garden Club, and I, I just always love your bouncy spirit and your curiosity. Tell us a little bit about your job and, and what you know about the history of the gardens at the Cortez Museum. I would love to share that. It's looking pretty gorgeous over here right now. Well, I'm I'm the managing director curator, and what's quite exciting at the museum right now is that I'm involved um, with one of the other board members, volunteers, Nancy Kendall, in putting together a new exhibit, and it's called Listening to Bees. And so because it's all about wild bees and honeybees and various other things about bees, we're really focused on what's up in the garden. And uh, the Heritage Garden has a really solidly beautiful history, which I really love to share with you. So it was designed in 2000 by Donna McLaren, who is our Heritage Garden expert volunteer, and she is still on the board here today and has, as I say, designed it in 2000 and at that time started soliciting plant donations from islanders. And the donations that we were looking for and still are, you know, still the sort of focus of the garden is heritage plants from the 1950s or earlier, and that would be plants, shrubs, even trees. And uh, whatever was available to islanders in a way from the 1890s until the 1950s are the things that we have incorporated into this gorgeous outdoor space that, you know, really, as many people will know, is open 24-7. You know, if our museum isn't open... Uh, you can't, you can come up on the front porch, but you can always go into the garden and sit at the picnic table if it's out, if it's not winter, and enjoy bird song and flowers and bees and, and such. Mm-hmm. It is a beautiful space. And I 
I didn't realize it's 21 years old already. Thank that, goodness. Yeah. And, you know, when you I look that. out there, there's quite a few mature things. Of course, it's amazing what will happen over a 21-year period. Having said that, a lot of these are probably really survivor plants. Survivor plants. That's what we need these days. Yes. <laughs> Tell and me about some of And one of the things the- that Donna, mm-hmm. I was on the phone with Donna McLaren this morning, just sort of running, a, you know, sort of the ideas of what I would you know, tell the listeners today about, but uh, what specifically she said, make sure that you really share sort of the, the, the intent and, and sort of the, the overall, I guess, almost philosophy about this garden is that plants carry our memories. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. Just like old friends. Yes. And I think all of us, anybody who's a gardener or who appreciates gardens, knows a lot about what that means to them. They'll go into a garden and they'll see a specific plant. A memory will just flash at them. Yes. That, you know, right back to their childhood garden or their grandmother's garden or some experience that they had exactly in a garden, whether yes. it be a one one flowering box of geraniums or something. That's you know? right. And it's not just the visual, right? It's the fragrance. Yeah. I mean, you smell lily of the valley and you think grandma's garden. Yeah. <laughs> right. That old factory memory is so powerful. It really is. In fact, it's it's one of the most evocative. Okay, so what else is going on in there? Well, I guess one of the exciting things that I really wanted to share today is the fact that we've just installed three Mason Bee houses. So because our bee exhibit opens on May 20th inside the museum, we've also added things to the garden. So Mason Bees came from the Oyster River Black Creek area from a, uh, a man by the name of Gordon Sear who raises them and rents the boxes and such two people on Cortez and Quadra. You probably already know all about that. Oh, he's famous. Uh, and they, so we've installed ours and they're active, like instantly. Mm. There's mason bees out and about looking for, for uh, flowers and trees uh, that are in bloom. In the garden right now, we have the apple trees are in bloom. And that's a particular favorite of the mason bee <laughs> because mm-hmm. they like open, open, more open flowers. They're not as prone like a bumblebee is to go right into the, you know, like a snapdragon, go right inside and you see this thing quivering. Well, the mason bee like a more open flower. And we, these three apple trees that we have, you talk about carrying memories because these, you know, most islanders over the course of that 1890s to 1950s, whether it be on any of the islands in the Gulf Islands, the Discovery Islands, they had apple trees. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that they had, a lot of gardens had, was peonies. And it's very interesting. If you go to old abandoned homesteads and there's a bit of a standing chimney or there's a very rough foundation left, the one other, two other things that you'll generally find on these sites is Apple trees and peonies. Yeah, and peonies, you know, Jane, are so expensive these days. Oh. You know, um, you you can buy a, a gallon pot and spend as much as $30 for Goodness. for a peony. So, you know, save those peonies, folks, if you've got them on your, on your homestead. They don't transplant very well, but I want to drop by and see those peonies. They must be budding out right now. They're starting. They're a little, I mean, it's been a bit cool. We've had a kind of a cool spring. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but then I, I think so. We so say it every year and then I look at the records and it's like, oh, no, this is the way it was last spring. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'm always curious. Like I didn't keep a record and I always think I will, but I didn't. And I so I don't really have that. But, oh, I hear you. But it, it is it is fascinating just about those, you know, the islanders came to the islands, they planted these things, they didn't succeed, maybe the people as mm. far as staying, but the peonies and the apple trees did. And uh, so anyway, the, the other thing that's, um, I mean, one of the other plants that I love in our garden here, and generally I get to work and the first thing I do is I tour the garden. I just can't resist. Mm -hmm. I I walk in the gate and I just think, okay, I'm just going to do a quick tour. I do it at my own garden, you know, how many times a day, I'm not sure. But come here and I check it all out and see, well, what's looking like it's doing well, what's coming on, what's late, what's not doing well. And the one plant that I really love back there that is, I think, something that I want in my garden and don't have is wallflower. Oh, yeah. And it's a purple flower. And the one that we have is a perennial. Apparently, a lot of wallflowers may be biennial, 
Mm-hmm. And this one is um, is called Bowles Mauve, B O W L E S Mauve. Mm-hmm. And the beauty about it is that it's a very early spring bloomer, and it blooms for a long time, like right up, I think, into late au- like into August. Nice. Well, there's a reason that wallflowers were just an absolute standard in. Uh, the gardens of old, you know, you look at some of these pictures, like you say, from the 1890s and 1950s, wallflowers were a staple flower. Really? Yeah. And they're not hard to propagate. You can do a root cutting or do a layering. So I think you're going to probably be getting a few requests after. Okay. uh, Well, I'm going to go, because I've done the layering thing before with a couple of things. And I'm excited about that because I I just every year look at that plant and think I I really need to get my hands on one. And they are still available. But I like your idea of doing something, you know, with the layering thing. So the other thing that I I, um, wanted to just let people know about, too, is that on our website, CortezMuseum.ca, we have several garden blogs. One of them is specifically about peonies. And a while back, we did an in-museum, in in-gallery in exhibit on, on peonies. And then from that exhibit, put it onto an online exhibit. And it's beautiful and talks about very specific peony species, you know. And then there's another one about lilies. And the third one is about late summer and fall blooming flowers, which I think a lot of people who may be planning a garden right now would be interested in looking at because I know for me that's what I struggle with. Mm-hmm. I have well, lots of early bloomers. You're talking dahlias, probably, right? Yeah, dahlias, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, lilies are on that too, and well, it's just a whole bunch of these things that were in the garden at a certain point. Um, Helenium, I'm looking at it right now. There's, I think it's a coreopsis, maybe or a, another anemone. There's a, I don't even know what this one. Peacock orchid. The, oh, of course, the hydrangea. And then, you know, other other things that turn beautiful color in the fall, like shrubs, like burning bush and things like that. So that's an interesting blog there just for getting that late season color. Yeah. And it's so inspiring right now to see what you can can do, because some of the uh, some of these things you can actually plant now. It's not too late. And I do love those blogs. You know, there are whole garden clubs devoted to peonies only, dahlias only. (laughs) Yeah, that's how specialized it can get. It's a great website. And I really encourage people to go. And I love that people can just come and drop into the garden anytime. Yes. And, yes. and hang out there. Listen, we need to reconnect throughout the season, Jane, so that you can tell us what's blooming in the Cortez Museum Heritage Garden. Will you, will you do that with I'd us? I'd love to. Yes. I love doing this. And it's always great to have any kind of connection with other, with you from the Cortez and Quadra Garden Clubs and just connect about plants. You know, we we love plants so much, so I'd love to share more information as the season goes, and we'll just uh, be in touch about what seems like it's a good timing on that. Absolutely, I, I have a feeling it won't be too long. Things are things are popping, but I love uh, what you said. They came, they planted, and even if they didn't survive, their plants did. <laughs> exactly, Thank you. Thank exactly. You so They'll much. be here long after we're all gone. <laughs> That's right. So yeah, we just we just want to welcome anybody that is interested in coming to the museum and or the heritage garden. We're open and we have wonderful exhibits going on. And as I say, the new one, Listening to Bees, is just really for gardeners and and, and anybody else that's interested in creatures on this planet. But gardeners will love this this, uh, exhibit. Yep. I will be there. Great. Thank you for everything. You will be there. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Excellent. Thank you for everything you're doing, Jane. It's wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. We've been talking with Jane Newman, the Managing Director for the Cortez Island Museum and Archive Society. To find out more about the Cortez Museum and its heritage garden, just go to cortezmuseum.com. Gabbing About Gardening radio show is sponsored by Speedy Bin Compost Bins. Just go to speedybin.com to see the great selection of rat-proof and raccoon-proof compost bins, and then reach out to Joyce at speedybin.com. Joyce and her family have been making speedy bins for more than 30 years. She lives and gardens in Merville, and she'll help you choose the perfect speedy bin composter for your location. And thank you also to the Campbell River Garden Club, the Cortez Island Garden Club, the Quadra Island Garden Club, all of them for their generous support of gabbing 
about gardening. I'm Lucretia. This is Gabbing About Gardening, Cortez Radio, CKTZ 89.5 FM. Carry on, regardless. back. We're going to gap with Nadia Call from her developing garden on North Quadra Island. Uh, Nadia is on the line with us from Quadra. Hey, Nadia, thanks for joining Hi, us. It's great to have an opportunity to gab with you about your garden and your garden life. You know, I haven't seen you for a while, but when I've seen pictures of what's going on. You have amazing garlic. You're growing ginger. Your children are growing. You've got <laughs> goats. How are you? And how does your garden grow, Nadia? Well, we are really good. And we are loving um, this early spring coming awake season in our garden and see, watching everything that we planted last year start to pop up. Our garlic is amazing and and uh, we've been building lots of garden beds and getting ready for um, putting all of our little seedlings into the ground so we're pretty excited oh that's wonderful so planting in the fall is is something that a lot of people are learning how to do do you find that it just really gives you that jump start on the spring definitely i mean having kale in the ground and I tried uh, growing corn salad last year, and I got it started. And so this spring, uh, even daikon radishes and some of the dill that I put in the ground, everything that was not really underway last fall just came back with a vengeance. Nice. <laughs> so we've been eating salad and 
since the end of March uh, from our garden. So that's been pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Good for you. And that corn salad, those pretty little blue flowers are popping out now, aren't they? And they're edible. Yes, it's so awesome. My daughter loves getting to eat the flowers. And we're excited about having our nasturtiums pop up and the calendula and and um, yeah, it's pretty awesome to see everything start to come alive in a week again in the spring. Mm-hmm. It's quite magical. Now, you've mentioned the children. Tell us what they're doing in the garden and, and how you've brought them into this, this new gardening life. And remind me when you came to Quadra? We've been here for almost two years, mm-hmm. which feels like it happened really fast. <laughs> um, but we've been here for almost two years and we're headed into... We're almost one year into having goats and chickens and growing gardens here in BC. So we're from Manitoba. So all of my gardening knowledge and experience is Central Prairie Garden. And so it's been a a learning curve and an exciting new opportunity to um, explore what's possible here. And they've been definitely just in it with me figuring things out. Simon, uh, my son, planted all pretty much all of the garlic last fall, getting and he has been keeping an eye on it. We just measured it; some of it's almost two and a half feet tall. The greens, oh <laughs> That's my, pretty awesome. He's that excited is. about it. Yeah, and they they really love process of being outside and watching things grow and seeing some of the massive plants that come from, like medicine plants, particularly that come from like a very very tiny seed. So they've been a part of the planning of it and taking part in what's going on and where we plant stuff and berry bushes and and that we got raspberries from you and they're doing amazing. And oh, that's good. so they're yeah, they're very excited about um, being able to eat fruit from the garden this year. Well, I got those raspberries from somebody else in our neighborhood. You know, um, just for listeners, I'm not far from where Nadia lives on North Quadra Island. We have a eight and a half acre garden there. And those raspberry canes that I gave to you and your family, Nadia, came from another neighbor almost 20 years ago. And I've given so many of them away. So it's just one of those lovely things that gardeners get to do with each other is is share their plans. Yes. Well, that's something that I definitely have appreciated about all of the people that we have met and connected with through small farming and gardening here on the island. And um, everybody is just so willing to share their starts and share things that they've got going that are perennials and and um, share their knowledge so freely and to encourage the like, um, community food that's happening here. It's pretty amazing. We really mm. love being a part of it. Wonderful. So it's been an easy transition overall. From, from Manitoba, <laughs> well, I mean, or should I not say easy? Not with goats. <laughs> I think it's I think it's all relative, but we've been enjoying the journey, and of course, just the challenges that have hit the world in the last while. It's been um, a really huge gift to be able to he- be here during everything and to be in the forest and and um, just acknowledging the privilege of that and being able to grow our own food and know where our food comes from and and have such a wealth of knowledge around us of people who've been growing here for so long and, and kind of tapping into that and learning about seeds and seed saving and all of that has been really wonderful for our family. So, yeah, it's a big gift. It's a big gift to be here. It really is. I, I'm feeling it as you're speaking it, uh, that that feeling of, of grateful and recognizing that wherever people are, they can do a degree of gardening on the balcony, on the windowsill, you know, growing parsley, uh, growing lettuces. There's there's always something you can grow. Don't you find if you have a plant growing around you, you just have a sense of well-being? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I think I posted a little while ago about my ginger plant when it actually successfully sprouted out and I was like whenever I was feeling um even my like even like my kids and my husband I see them go over and stand beside the ginger and they touch the leaves because <laughs> oh. you just have this this feeling like something new is growing and well and we're about to have um tiny goat babies born on our farm and we've never we've never um done that before so that's a really big 
exciting moment that we've been building towards and just having, you know, that, that burst of new life and have something alive growing near you and know that you're a part of it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty great. And the goats, how did that all come about? And we'll come back to the ginger because I know people will want a few growing tips on ginger. Um, <laughs> sure. So are, are the goats from a local source on Quadra Island? Yeah. Um, so just down the island, uh, a lovely couple, uh, Gerald and Janice Adamson, have a beautiful goat set up on their little piece of land um, in South Quadra. And we got connected to them through um, um, a Facebook group, actually, that popped up. It was called the Quadra Island Goat Group. And we hadn't decided to get goats um, yet. We hadn't made any final decisions. But my son and I, particularly at that time, my daughter's very much in, in it on it now. We had been talking about it even back in Manitoba. And so this popped up, and and, and um, we had met another, another lovely lady who's since moved off to Quadra. But she had goats. Too, and we met her goat and then we went to this meeting and met a whole bunch of wonderful quadra people and our friendship just kind of grew and blossomed from there particularly with Gerald and Janice and um, they're a wealth of knowledge uh, with having goats and so they were very encouraging and so we built a little barn a year ago uh, just over a year ago and then in last June we got three goats or four goats, actually. And then this year, two of our goats are going to have babies. So oh. it's been a wonderful adventure. Oh, kids galore. Kids galore. <laughs> a lot right. of milking. <laughs> what are you going to do with all that goat milk? Well, I've been making cheese all winter uh, from our one goat that is currently, st I'm still milking her. So we have fresh goat milk in our coffee. We are making yogurt and cheese. And um, when we have the next, goats in milk when I'm milking them we'll be able to actually start making more complicated cheeses that get stored like cheddars and different things like that so I'm excited about that learning adventure too because it's definitely um, a whole other world of cheese cultures and all of mm -hmm. those kinds of things I love so goat cool. cheeses they're just delish and thank you for telling us about the Quadra Island Goat Group I know that Janice and Gerald are great ambassadors for anyone who wants to get into goats they really shepherd excuse the pun shepherd you along um, to, to help they really you they, they don't just hear your goats bye bye now they really stay with you and they stay connected it's great okay just really quickly yeah. how are you growing ginger root in a pot <laughs> well um, I tried I tried once before with just popping ginger root into the soil and keeping it moist and it didn't it didn't grow then I tried um, I just got some organic ginger root from the grocery store and I put it into um, a paper bag in the dark, in a dark space. And I just kind of, it was warm in there and I kept it until it started to form the little, you'll see little green nodules growing on the side of your root. And I waited until they were, you know, pretty decently sized and started inside of the inside of the paper bag and then I got a big pot and uh, some potting soil and I put them in about an inch under the soil and I just kept it moist and those little nodules now I have um let's see probably about 10 10 green shoots and the, those little shoots that I posted a picture of a little while are now like two and a half three feet tall wow and, uh, yeah, it's really growing. And then we just got two brand new little shoots popping up closer to the edge. I'm probably going to have to attempt to repot it because the way ginger grows, it grows sideways, mm -hmm. right, instead of down. So it needs a lot of space to spread out. So Great. we'll see how that ginger. goes. Ginger. Yeah. Goats. Yay. I hear the rooster in the background. Do you do you have a, do you have a name for your for your little homestead there? Do you call it anything special other uh, than we've wonderful? Been calling it, we've been calling it Wild Island Homestead, and I have a little Instagram page. I'm very bad at posting on, so that's our little homestead, and we uh, have about 20 chickens now. And the, the wow. rooster is letting us know that absolutely he's, that he's the boss. <laughs> he is the boss. <laughs> 
<laughs> and Nadia Cole uh, from Wild Island Homestead, thank you so much for telling us about your beautiful piece of paradise on Quadra for Island. Sure. We'll check back again another time, Nadia. Have a Sounds lovely great, day. Liz. Thanks Have so much. Day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Now, I've been talking to Nadia Cole from her beautiful homestead, Wild Island Homestead on Quadra Island. Next up is Jennifer Banks Doll, who's going to gab about what's cooking in her farm kitchen. Hang in there with us. This is Gabbing About Gardening. I'm Lucretia, and this is Cortez Radio, CKTZ, 89.5 FM, CortezRadio.ca. We're coming back in a minute. When I was a curly-headed baby, my daddy sat me down upon his knee. He said, son, you go to school and learn your letters. Don't you be no dusty minor boy like me Well, I was born and raised at the mouth of the hazard holler Coal cars roared and a rumble past my door Now they stand in a row all rust and empty And the yelling end don't stop here anymore I used to think my daddy was a black man had scrimp enough to buy the company store Now he goes to town with empty pockets And his face is white as a February snow Well I was born and raised at the mouth of the hazard holler Cold cars roaring and a rumble past my door Now they stand in a row all rusty and empty And the yelling end stop here anymore I never thought I'd learn to love the coal dust I never thought I'd love to hear those tipples roar But God, if only grass could turn to money Them greenbacks fill my pockets once more Well, I was born and raised at the mouth of the hazard holler Cars roaring and a rumble past my door. Now they stand in a row, all rust and empty. And the yelling end don't stop here anymore. Trees and grass will are growing through the floor. And there were trees and grass will are growing through the floor. Well, I was born and raised at the mouth of the hazard holler. Cold cars roared and a rumble past my door. Now they stand in a row, all rust and empty. And the other end don't stop here anymore. Well, I was born and raised. At the mouth of the hazard holler Cold cars roaring and a rumble past my door Now they stand in a row all rusty and empty And the yelling end don't stop here anymore No, the yelling end don't stop here anymore And welcome back to Gabbing About Gardening. I'm your host, Lucretia Shanfarber. We've been listening to the beautiful music of Willow, the all-woman band from Quadra Island. 
boy, I could listen to them for hours. But I can also listen to Jennifer Banks Doll talk about what's going on on her 40 acre homestead on Quadra Island. Hi, Jen. Thanks. Hi, Lou. Thanks so much for gabbing with us. We've seen recent pics on the Gabbing About Gardening Facebook page of you in your kitchen making some (laughs) really yummy looking stuff. What have you been making, Jen? Well, you know, uh, our main focus on our farm is growing healthy food, but once in a while you need to have something a little special. So this time of year, we're harvesting elder flowers from our tree that just happens to be growing here on our homestead. And when you were talking earlier with Jane, I'm wondering if it's one of those other things that people planted, because I know there's quite a few people with these trees that just happen to be on their property. So... Right. And there's a native elder, um, Sambucus canadensis, as I recall. Do you know which kind uh, you're harvesting from? Well, the one that we have is a, is a red elderberry. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people don't realize the, the berries themselves, you're not supposed to eat them when they're raw because they're highly toxic, but you can eat them cooked. But the flowers are completely edible and it flowers before the, the black elderberry, which is like the canadiensis or the nigella. So this one is the Sambucus rasmosa. Rasmosa. Don't you love yeah. those names? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they all make sense once you kind of wrap your head around the Latin version of everything. So yeah. I, I saw that you had the ladder up against the tree. And I mean, what is it like to harvest elder flowers on a ladder? You have to have a good sense of balance, right? <laughs> yeah, to be honest with you, Mark was the one who went up the ladder to harvest them for me because, um, yeah, I'm a little bit afraid of heights. But, you know, to make elder elderflower cordial, you only need about, you know, 30 flower heads. So you don't need to go up on a ladder to harvest them. Oh. Often they're growing within easy reach wow. uh, for harvesting. Okay, L- walk us through it. 30 flower heads. First of all, describe what a flower head is. Yeah, and I'll describe the tree because, to be honest with you, there's quite a lot of trees right now that have white flowers that look quite similar. So I can usually verify it by the smell. But of course, if you don't know what elder flowers smell like, it might be a little bit tricky. But basically on this tree, there's many little flowers on the flower head. And the flower head is at the end of the stem. So there's like one flower head per stem. And then on either side, there's a set of five you know, kind of oblong, serrated leaves, you know, the five with, you know, two on one side, two on the other, and then one at the end, frame this one flower head at the end. Mm -hmm. And if you're harvesting, of course, you don't want to take all the flowers, just, you know, a scattering of flowers from the tree, so the rest will turn into the berries. And so there's lots of different things you can do with these. Oh, but I should say, the real tell for this flower is it has an incredible smell. It just, it's so sweet. It smells almost like honey. It's just this incredible Mm. smell that, I don't know, I, nothing else smells like elderflower to me. Mm -hmm. And I I think the, you know, all the elderflowers smell quite similar. And are the bees buzzing all around it? Oh yeah, there's so much for the bees right now though on our property. So, but yeah, the bees are really attracted by the smell. And then I think a lot of other um, insects are attracted because of these little flowers. Mm-hmm. So when you pick them, you actually, you should leave them for, you know, an hour or two and let all the little critters fly away or crawl away because they're oh, definitely attracted oh, good. to these good. flowers. <laughs> unless you don't really mind a little bit of, of, um, Insect, a little protein. In <laughs> well, but a, a wonderful reminder. And thanks so much for such a great ID uh, uh, over them. So the smell, it smells like sweet honey, one flower head per stem, five leaves. A reminder, don't take all those flowers, which is always something that Dr. Nancy Turner is reminding us about. It's an indigenous way of, of harvesting and wildcrafting because a lot of these are, are wild elders, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I can't really confirm that, but I know they're growing all around the island. Mm-hmm. They grow in the middle of forests and they grow on people's property, so I'm not sure. 
So you've got so the flowers, you're... and and you're letting all of the critters crawl out. Yeah, and you want to harvest the flowers, you know, on a day, you know, kind of a sunny day, not too far into the day for the, you know, the best quality flowers. And so to make cordial, like I said, you want about 30 flower heads, which if you were to measure them as a, as the flower heads, you, it would be about four and a half cups. But then you want to remove all those little flowers from the stem because the stem is pretty bitter. And so you just want those little white flowers. So you just gently, I find using my fingers is the easiest, but you might want to use a fork instead and just kind of gently pull the flowers off. And then you're going to zest about four lemons, boil about a liter and a half or six cups of water, and then you're going to basically infuse the water with the, the lemon rind and the flowers. So you don't want to boil the flowers in the water. You just want to have, you know, the boiled water, take it off the burner, put the flowers in. And I like to infuse them for about 48 hours. Now, you probably only need to do it for a few hours, but I like to get maximum benefit and it doesn't turn it bitter or anything. So I basically, I just leave it um, until I have time to do the rest. And then once it's infused, you're going to strain it. And you could just use a sieve or you can use, you know, some cloth if you want a finer strain and not get any of the residue in it. And then you're going to put it back in a big pot and add four cups of sugar. So like I said, this is a special treat. It's a lot of sugar. Um, You could try honey instead, although that's a lot of honey that you would need. And basically the sugar acts as a preservative. So if you use less sugar, it might not keep as well. And then you're also going to juice those lemons. So you'll put this juice of four lemons, add that to the pot, boil it, let it boil for about 10 minutes. And in the meantime, you want to prepare some sterilized jars. Um, I do everything in mason jars. So I'll boil up my mason jars. I usually do it in just like small little jars. I'll boil up the tops. And then when I've boiled my concoction, my cordial for 10 minutes, and I'll pour it into my hot jars and seal them. And then once they cool, I store them in a nice, cool, dark place and they keep, well, mine from last year is still good. So Mm. they keep for a long time. Now, is that the stuff you brought to me when you were picking up some of the Keltman fertilizer? Yeah. Oh, my goodness, girl. That is so delish. I know. I know. (laughs) So this is something, you know, I'm really a, a city girl turned country. And when I used to live in the city, one of my best friends used to make this double martini that she used to put the San Germain elderflower liqueur in. And, you know, one day I went to the liquor store and I said, I'll just see how much this liqueur is. It's just so amazing. I want to buy it. Well, it's $80 Mm. for a bottle. Whereas this is something you can make at home and you can add it to your liqueur. I mean, you could make liqueur as well. Mark tried it this year. But I find if you make a cordial, then it's just so multi-purpose. You can add soda water. You can make it into ice cream. I just add it to my frozen yogurt recipe and make it into frozen yogurt. Wow. You can, you know, have it on top of your ice cream. So it's really a concentrated flavoring as well yeah. as a, a lovely cordial. So many uses. Yeah, it's a simple syrup. So, But my favorite use is what I gave to you, which I brought to you, which is in lemonade. I don't know. Just lemon and elderflower is just the best combination I've ever oh, had. It was amazing. It was a really, really hot day. Mm-hmm. And you showed up. It was a beautiful surprise. And I I have loved you ever since. <laughs> I felt a little guilty. I didn't realize Lee was going to be with you or I would have brought two. Oh, we shared. It worked out fine. So what's coming up next in the, in the, on the homestead for you? What are, what's your next focus? You're always making something. Oh, there's so many things. Well, but this time of year, though, it's really the elderflowers, the spruce tips are at the same time. So we do lots of things with spruce, spruce tips. Spruce tips. Wow. Rhubarb and nettle season is pretty much Done. I mean, you could still go out and harvest some nettles, but I think 
they're past their prime at this point. Oh, you are one um, busy farm lady, a city girl turned country. I love that definition of you, Jim. <laughs> We're going to want to check back with you again and and hear what's going on in that beautiful kitchen of, it is foot, what foot you call your place? Foot Forward Forest Farm. <laughs> foot Forward Forest Farm. We've been talking with Jennifer. Thank you so much, Jen. I look forward to another Thanks gabbing session. Me. Yes, we'll talk again soon. That's Jennifer Banks doll, the city girl turned country. Love that definition. Coming up next is Owen Williams. He'll give us some of his tried and true tips on big container gardening. And if there's time, he might also give us a few reasons why gardening might be good for your relationship. He is a relationship counselor after all. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Another story, once upon a time There was a boy and a girl and some wicked rhymes I guess the stars were aligned, don't you know It's all about time Thing. She was a real cutie with red apple cheeks He was a wolf in swan's clothing She's a mystery, he said this gal's for me Just wait and see One day he rode right up And walked on right through the door He pulled over a chair and stroked her long hair While she just lay there He said, hey, how's it going? I know that you don't know me just as well I like the beaches, long walks I like candlelit talks Hey, I think I hear wedding bells Sometime at midnight or maybe later He whispers in her ear I think I love you, dear The sky's falling Whoa. The sky is falling in love Falling in love He was in a little closer Well, take advantage, no, sir I've only done this once or twice and Welcome you're back to Gabbing About Gardening I'm Lucretia, and we have Owen Williams from his garden on Quadra Island on the phone to gab with us. Hi, Owen. Welcome to Gabbing About Gardening. Hi, Lou. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you. You know, the last time I saw your garden, I was so impressed with the layout and the containers and the productivity. Can you describe your garden to us a bit? Sure. I've got uh, 15 raised beds, uh, mostly 5 by 10, uh, that are 20 inches deep. And uh, that's because I uh, I live on a rock. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and I've got a little bit of area that I, I've actually cultivated soil to grow in the ground. Oh, nice. You're growing soil now. I'm growing soil. <laughs> Best thing to do. Yeah, I'm doing quite a lot of that myself. I, I find actually, if I focus on growing soil, the plants just grow themselves. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you growing in, in those containers these days? Well, everything that we need to eat, um, it, it's a, a real pleasure for me to you know, whether it's salads, you know, obviously tomato season coming up and cukes and all that. But, you know, I've got potatoes and carrots and onions in the ground and leeks and, of course, garlic from the fall and uh, lots of brassicas and cauliflowers that are no, almost ready to uh, to pick, which is amazing for this time of year. Mm-hmm. Did you put those cauliflowers in in the fall? No, uh, no, I planted them... Uh, eight weeks ago, we've had it fairly warm on the south end of Quadra. Yes, yes, it's it's it's. We've had days of warmth, <laughs> and then days of not so much warmth. What have you found have been? Well, first of all, when did you come to Quadra Island? What's what's um, the backstory there? Yeah, we're coming up on five years, and um, so I have not gardened since I was a teenager. Um, I grew up on a farm and love you know, cultivating fresh food, but didn't have an opportunity to really do that in the city and with my career. Uh, and the very first thing that I did was I found a source of manure and decided that I was going to start making soil. Mm, number one, find the local manure source. <laughs> and then what, and then what happened with, uh, with that? How, how did you proceed? Well, I started small. Um, I, I, I built four garden beds and, um, 
you know, I, I did import some soil from other areas on the island, but it didn't have a lot of uh, you know, nutritional value in it. So making soil, collecting leaves, you know, composting was uh, an important part of getting started. But I had a vision that we could produce 70% of our own food. Wow, that's that's a pretty ambitious vision. Uh, how How is that going? Well, it's going really well. Uh, up until three weeks ago, we were still eating potatoes and leeks and kale out of the garden from last year. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things that's been hard for me is knowing when to plant as a, as a new gardener, as a novice. And really fortunate that there's, there's a few uh, well-established gardeners who are willing to, to be garden mentors, and that has been uh, an absolute blessing. Ah, good for you. And you're becoming one of those too, especially with this container gardening you're, you're doing. I'm, you know, I was so impressed, and you have 15 of yes. those beautiful, deep uh, containers now. You know, Container gardening, I think, is really appealing to a lot of people. Of course, you and your situation, uh, because you live on a, a rock, a beautiful rock, I might add. Your place, <laughs> your place is magnificent with a magnificent view. Um, what sort of advice do you have for people who are just getting into thinking about container gardening? You know, p- people feel overwhelmed at the thought of of beginning. What sort of advice do you have for people just starting out? Well, I think the key, Lou, is to start small uh, and to know what it is you really, like, what's the outcome that you want to uh, experience from gardening? For me, gardening is a meditation. It's a... uh, it's a chance for me to connect with the rhythm of life. You know, that, that wonderful, I'm not religious in any way, but that saying, give and you shall receive. If you give to your garden, you're going to receive more than just food. It's, it's the pleasure of seeing the, you know, the laws of nature function. And I think if, if, if we can tap into that, then, you know, the taste of a delicious tomato or a parsnip, um, make, makes it all so much more worthwhile. And so if, if people start small, I think that's the way to go. Start small is always great advice. Uh, now are you starting your plants by seed? Are you buying seedlings? How, how, how are you, how are you going with that this spring? Well, a little bit of both. Um, I did construct a, a small greenhouse. Um, but I'm still working pretty much full time, so it's been hard for me to know when to get seeds in, in pots. And, um, so I have, you know, already bought some starts, but I, you know, I've, I've started herbs and, um, cucumbers and, um, what else do I have? Oh, you know, uh, beans. You had a thing about uh, red kidney beans, um, you know, they are perennials, but uh, I often start new ones each year. Oh, yes, the Scarlet Runners. Wasn't that amazing? <laughs> we had uh, someone post on the Gabbing About Gardening Facebook page that when they went into their garden, that their Scarlet Runner beans from last year were popping up uh, from the same root system. And you commented that that they do that for you pretty regularly. Well, I grew up in in the UK, and uh, they're notoriously seen as uh, perennial there. Notoriously. Yeah. Well, because it's a bean that keeps on giving. <laughs> That's right, whether you want it to or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh, well, you know, I, I I think that people are waking up to this other comment that, that popped up in that same thread that you uh, made comment on, and, and that is that instead of pulling our annuals, especially our nitrogen-fixing annuals like peas and and beans out of the soil just cut them off at ground level so they can continue to to nourish the soil i'm doing that a, i'm doing that a lot mm. uh, uh, and it's funny you know one of those things where you think about it and you go oh of course that makes sense why didn't i think of that before but it's become a really popular regenerative soil practice now 
Well, and that's, you know, as a novice gardener, that's something that I wasn't aware of until I, I saw that posting. And so for me, there's just so much to learn, and it's very exciting to yeah, actually to even make mistakes, because that's how we learn. I love that attitude. It is exciting to make mistakes. So instead of beating ourselves up for our gardening mistakes and our many other mistakes in life, tell us a little bit about your philosophy. You are a relationship counselor. How how are you integrating this gardening thing? You talked about connecting with the rhythm of life and giving back to the soil. Do you have some more words of wisdom for us? (laughs) Well, as in any relationship, you know, it, it is a give and take. Um, you have to have patience. Um, you know, gardens don't just pop up overnight. When we when we see uh, someone who has um, a well developed garden, it's like having a well developed relationship. It's happened over time, and you know, you have made mistakes, you have learned from things, and you know, hopefully, you just don't throw your tools away and um and give up on it and and in relationships with human beings we have to stay the course and i think there's just so much richness that we can get from being in this rhythm of <clears throat> learning how <clears throat> excuse me learning how to relate to another person or an entity like like plants Mm. Um, my mother uh, used to talk to her plants. I know some people thought that was crazy. She had the most amazing garden, and she could make any plant grow. Um, but she loved plants. She had that connection. And I think it's something that we've lost. Mm. It sounds like it really rubbed off on you. You're, you're carrying that through. Now, uh, may I get a little personal here for a moment? Sure. I, I, I don't mean to um, tax your professional advice too much, but my husband and I. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better than starting with, oh, we have a friend. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, he is my friend and he is my husband. Um, you know, we don't always see eye to eye in the garden. Um, we, we've, we've, we've had a few, shall we say, altercations over various things. How do you, um, how do you suggest resolving these little gardening conflicts in relationships? Well, um, my partner and I have the same kind of stuff go on. And so we've agreed one of us looks after flowers and one of us looks after vegetables. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we do have some input into uh, each other's areas, but I think I think it's important that one person leads in an area, um, and that the other, you know, surrenders and follows that lead. And you can't be in in lead all the time, but I think that's an important part of the ebb and flow of relationship. Ah. Oh. I feel so much better after this. My goodness, <laughs> I don't want that you. was even free, Lou. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't realize that was going to come up for me. Thank you so very much, Owen. I really appreciate not only the gardening wisdom, but the relationship wisdom and how, how it really does relate to plants as well. Uh, relationships with each other, with plants with all of beautiful Mother Nature. I hope you'll come back and and have another gabbing session with us sometime. All right. Well, thanks for doing the show. I'm sure it's of great value to lots of people. Thank you. You've been of great value to us. That's Owen Williams from Quadra Island. He's a fabulous container gardener, as well as a wonderful relationship counselor. That's our show for today. We'll be back next Tuesday at 1130 with professional market gardener and horticulturist Arzina Hamir gabbing about her tips for growing terrific tomatoes. And biologist Steve Mooney is going to be gabbing about wild plants that heal disturbed soil. We call them weeds, but maybe we need to rethink them and appreciate the job they do in our gardens. That's next week on Gabbing About Gardening. And remember to join us on Facebook and Instagram. And every Monday, 
On Zoom, we host the Gabbing About Gardening Zoom Gathering for Gardeners. It's free. It's fun. It's informative. Next Monday, we'll talk dirty with soil health enthusiast, Mark Dahl. You can get all the details on our Facebook page and our Instagram page. Hey, thanks so much for being with us today on Gabbing About Gardening. And a huge thank you to producer Brian McKinnon. I'm Lucretia Shanfarver. This is Cortez Radio, CKTZ 89.5, cortezradio.ca. Thanks for tuning in. Now go outside and get dirty.